breaks chains and um, he just has a beautiful charm and we just pray for that and it will speak to us today in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're all emotional now. Huh? <laughs> I think I think people have heard me before. I, I, I often I just start with a sort of disclaimer and I go on and say how in actual fact I'm just a numpty. And I want to sort of explain that a bit more. And it's to assume that you can speak for God is hubris is, is a big thing to think that you can do. So even just to stand here and then make an attempt of it, you have to discuss to qualify. So I am just an umpty. I am just a common old garden idiot like the rest of us. But I have been given this incredible <coughs> gift of God. Mm. And so I just say that what I'm going to speak now is going to be from my own experience yeah. because that can't really be argued with. And if it's relevant to you, then, then, then please, if it's relevant for you, take it. If it's not relevant for you, don't mind it. Just let it go. And it's not anything special. <coughs> and what we're speaking on, and, and carrying on, because we've been speaking on, on, on uh, Rob Scott Cook came here, and just really, you could feel the Holy Spirit on this subject of bringing us into a place of prayer. And we've had really good understanding and teaching on prayer. Now, this time is on hearing God. And I think we all do, we all say that we do hear God. So, like I said, a lot of it might be relevant, a lot of it might not be relevant. But I want to just go through the thing to start off with, assuming we're all I'm making no presumptions about anybody here. And I was just thinking of the things, for start of all, that actually stop us from hearing God. And I thought, yeah, one thing we might all, all, all leap up with is, is um, all people might say, oh, I know, that would be sin. And in my own experience, it wouldn't be sin. Sin is the absolute opposite. When I hear God loud is when I'm thinking about doing things I shouldn't. God pursues me in that. And, uh, and so it isn't. You get this horrible, uncomfortable feeling that you know that you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Mm. And it's not condemnatory, but you know the truth and you know that you're living outside of the truth. Mm. So it isn't that as an easy, glib thing to say that it's sin that stops me hearing God. That's when I hear God. Um, accept, and the exception of that is, of course, and it's in Hebrews 3, 7, no. um, and it says, if today you hear God's voice, then don't harden your heart as your ancestors did in the rebellion. So there comes with that an incredibly stern warning that if you, whilst doing something that you know that you shouldn't be doing, and you have the conviction of the Holy Spirit on you, and you are being pursued, then don't harden your heart. Because the next time you do that thing and you've hardened your heart, you might find it just a little bit easier. And you find that God won't, will go so far, but won't impose. And it's easy to lose that. Marie is my great friend. I met Marie for the first time, before I'd even met Kate, in the 1980s. I was a on-fire Christian. Marie was a group of on-fire Christians singing in the middle of the street in Plymouth. Do you know what shocks me? The amount of people that we know from that time who lost their faith, who went cold. It's like, you ever saw that film, All Quiet on the Western Front? All these young and enthusiastic soldiers off the war, excited by it, and the devastation that happened. So it's not a, it's not a, it's a true thing. If you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. It's a really something that, 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 but other reasons that we might not hear God when we want to hear God. And that may be that you have an idea that God speaking to you is going to be harsh, 
and critical. And so you shy away from hearing God. You shy away from that sort of voice. You expect, you have the sense over over your shoulder all the time of something slightly condemnatory, slightly dark, slightly putting you down, slightly not, you're not quite coming up to this, this is what you think will be the voice of God. Mistakenly. But this is what will stop you from hearing or listening. The other side of that, haha, <laughs> is if you have an incredibly glib idea of what God's voice will be. And it's, we are able to be free with God, but there's a difference between being free and being glib. And it's the idea that God will be, oh, God is every, heavy, uh, God's happy with everything, but it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't really matter. And you know what I was saying the other day about it's easier to fantasize than it is to believe. And then you can fantasize a God that doesn't exist, and you can fantasize a God that's all right with you doing whatever it is you are doing. And so that's maybe, again, why you're not. I think probably a reason we don't hear God as we think we should or when we should <coughs> is that we pre-prescribe what we think God ought to say. And we've got an idea of how we think God ought to speak. And I think there's one example of this. It is um, Nietzsche, the philosopher Nietzsche, was born in 1850-something or 30-something, and I'm sure he was the one who was saying that uh, um, God is dead. And what he was saying by God is dead is saying that our society is losing God so rapidly and it was the foundation and everything of our whole understanding in our psyche, and we lost that. Well, nine years after Nietzsche was born, Freud was born. And Freud, Sigmund Freud, started psychoanalysis. And in this ghastly vacuum that humanity in the West given themselves by devoiding themselves of God, we started this new thing, which is psychoanalysis. It's self-examination. Now, I want to get quite precise on this because it's easy to be misunderstood. But in this mad race of life that we're doing, and it's like a cross-country race, yeah. and we're climbing through hedges and through barbed wire fences and over muddy fields yeah. and everything, we do sometimes get like your jersey caught on a barbed wire fence. Something happened, some trauma, something happened and you're stuck. And it is necessary to stop and go back and unpick yourself from that. And psychology has now come full circle to find out the way that people unpick themselves from traumas and things is they acknowledge their own culpability in their thing, if there is any, and they forgive. And so we had that all along. But we do need to go through that process. The difficulty comes, and this is where the church is, in the absence of a really alive relationship with God, started bringing in psychoanalysis into the service, into our ministry. And there comes a point where you've gone too far. And it's like the person who's got their jersey caught on the barbed wire fence is sort of... <laughs> and it's really fascinating. You get a psychiatrist to help you with this. And you sit there and, and you examine yourself. And then you're sat there you have not been running, it's dark, it's getting dark, you're miles from where you went to be, meant to be, it's cold and it's beginning to rain and you've got a pile of wool next to you. Mm. And so you say this to your psychiatrist and he says, well, that's interesting, I hear what you're saying. Let's try unpicking your trousers and see if we can examine that. The, the point of it is, is that our brain, and I'll come back to this later on, our brain is flesh like our stomach is flesh. And so when our parts of our body determine who and what we are, like our stomach, or like our sex organs, people's whole identity is derived around that part of their body, or their stomach is everything. Our brain is also flesh. It's, it's I'm gonna try and drive, and don't, I mean, everything I say is largely half-baked, so you might want to go and think about this and bake it properly at home. But it, our brain is flesh. It will rot 
like the rest of our body and stink. And if, for example, you've got brain damage, your soul, your psyche isn't damaged, just the machine is damaged, in the same way you've got a broken leg. And what we have to do is sort of... It's, it's, it's living with a brain which is, is very similar to like the algorithms that YouTube have. So YouTube will offer you a, a video, and if you like it, it'll offer you a similar one. Your brain is working for you, so if, for example, somebody is late and they haven't turned up, your brain will offer you a scenario of what's happened to them. You know, like run underneath a bus, or really gory, or something close. Your brain isn't you. This is something that's doing something for you, serving you in the same way as your stomach's digesting food. Your brain is offering you images and ideas and thoughts, and they're not always helpful. You have to try and select through your brain. If you try to seek God through your brain, you may struggle. There's a extraordinary man called Ian McAllister, who's really worth, he does this amazing, um, yeah. the master and his emissary explains. Yeah. It is fascinating how your brain works, yeah. but it is defining that distinction between what is your brain. And when we seek God through our brain exclusively, we have to use our brain, but when we exclusively, we find that we don't get yeah. anywhere, it's very hard to hear God with your actual physical organ, your brain. So then we're asking ourselves, well, what were the people doing who actually did hear God? So we're looking at people like Moses. Well, Moses went up the mountain alone. And Elijah, I mean, Elijah went up, he was up there for 40 days, he went uh, and went up a mountain. I'm going to read this Elijah bit because it's quite relevant. So this is Elijah, and he goes up into the mountains. Nineteen eleven, and he said, "So Elijah's sitting there in the mountains, and and a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake." And after the earthquake came the fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he, put, and he stood before the mouth of the cave. I mean, this small, still voice. And I can actually attest to having ex exactly the same. I mean, there's lots of my life it, it won't make sense. I actually had, for example, well, that, I was by the side of the road, I was looking for God. I'd heard God before. I mean, this is, you hear God sometimes in crises. You're really in a place of crises. This is your communication. You call out to God and you hear God in crises. I was travelling with horses back at that day. I was with people on the side of the road. The horses used to graze up and down um, in the lanes in Cornwall. And we're talking, and we all saw a car who was distracted by that drive into my horse. And we all saw it, and I got up and I shouted as an unbeliever, and I shouted, Oh God! at it. My voice stopped. Halfway through, time stopped. And a very clear voice said, Do you mean that? Or are you saying that in vain? And I said, Yeah, I was saying it in vain, but given the circumstances, I'd like to mean it. <laughs> Odd! And I ran, and I can't, we, none of us can explain that the horse wasn't hit, but someone who, somebody the day before had given me a dog, or travellers, here boy, take a dog like, and then we took, you know, we got given this dog, didn't know what to do, that dog came squealing out from under its wheels and was dead. But I mean, the difference between your horse going, and, you know, and that, I'd heard God then in crisis. But then I was there, and I'm some months later, still with horses, on my own, and I'm, Winter, cold. I remember so clearly smashing the ice on a trough to get the bucket in to get the water out for the horses. And saying, God, are you? Where are you? There must be God. Where are you? 
are you in an extraordinary nature? And I think, are you in the trees? And really clear voice, still, quiet voice. But no, no, I'm not there. God, are you in, you know, and going through these different things? And a small, still voice in my side would say, no, I'm not there. And then suddenly I think, that's you, isn't it? Yes. You've always been there. Yes. And then suddenly I that God is within you. So these people, Moses was up in the mountain, Elijah's up in the mountain, John the Baptist goes alone into the wilderness, Jesus is going into the wilderness, and we think, oh well, you can confer from that, oh well, in order to hear God, I have to go and do this extraordinary ordeal, I have to go into the wilderness and, 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 and not, and be without or, or, or fasting. The, the, the point of these isn't where they're going and what they're doing, it's the fact that they're being alone. And hearing God isn't doing things, it's at last not doing things. At last not doing things. And I think all those casualties that we've seen on the road, <coughs> It's people who are on fire, but were doing things. They were doing things for God. They were doing things for this. They were doing things. They were not stopping. And so, this I think is the key. In the same way I've, I've said once before, this man, um, Andrew Murray, was saying about humility. And he was saying that humility isn't one of the fruits of the Spirit. That humility is actually the ground that all the other fruits grow from. So is this quiet prayer the ground that all the other prayer comes out from? And so it's easy to sort of say, well, you have to go and be quiet, you have to go and do something, you have to go and not engage in the world. Doesn't necessarily do anything. And the idea of sitting quietly on your own is actually quite an overpoweringly odd, dull. It sounds like you have to eat brown rice <laughs> without any flavouring at all. It's good for you. And I think the fault of it all lies, if you feel that, the fault of it lies in let's go to Revelations 2 4. This is Jesus talking to the church. And he's saying to the church of Ephesus. And he's commending them on a lot of things. But he said, Yet I hold this against you. You have lost, you have forsaken the love that you had at first. You've lost your first love. <laughs> one John so we all know John 3.16 by heart one John 4.16 is it's best in the King James and it says he who dwells in love dwells in God God in them, for God is love. He who lives in God, he who lives in love, lives in God and God in them, for God is love. What we're being asked to do isn't going away and being in some dour, dour place, eating brown rice and bran. We're asked to go to that place of love. John 15, 5 to 12. You can go, these can go, read all the first letter of John. Read it and read it and read it and read it. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. 
If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. What we're being invited to and what we must make sure that we haven't lost is love. Now, I mean, you know, Paul says, you know, if I have to speak in the tongues of angels and everything but don't have love, I'm a sounding gong. And our bedrock and our foundation is to be in the state of love all the time. And I lost that big time. I lost my first love big time. And I had some dry, dull, empty gestures. And in that time, I met people in the church, not this church, in churches, who said things like, love is not a feeling, it's an act of the will. And I know that to be complete and utter tosh. <laughs> they were just covering up for the fact that they didn't feel love anymore in their lives. Try being in a marriage and saying to the person you're married to, I feel no emotion to you whatsoever, but I'll go through the motions of what I ought to do if I did love you, if I feel that. If you go to bed, I'll be up in 12 minutes. See how that works. And if you don't have that, you see, again, talking about wildernesses, people sort of say, you know, oh, brother, I'm having a wilderness experience. Mm -hmm. Everybody who went into the wilderness went in filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with love. Mm -hmm. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you've wandered. You've wandered away from God. And you need to get yourself back. You need to go and find where you went wrong and get back. Because your life depends on it. The numbers we can go through, I don't want to, but straight away, Cookie, all these people. Oh. Rejoice always, <coughs> Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in every circumstance. This is God's will for you in your life. <coughs> You're wanting to know, what is God's will for me in my life? Mm. That's it. Rejoice always. Be in that place of love. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I got in the habit, after having gone so horribly wrong, and by the skin of my teeth not being on the casualty list. Mm. We don't know where those people would end up, so I'm not going to draw but by the skin of my teeth not being on that casualty list. Mm. I started giving more time, and not the fantasy God that I made up, the real God who was real with me, and I needed to be real with God. Mm. So things started happening, like, for example, in the night I'd wake up, and rather than grumbling, tossing around and thinking, and going back to bed, I get up. I get up. And I make a cup of tea and I sit down and I'm not being all holy. I just sit and I talk with God. I talk with the one who loves me and I love God. Really? Really? Come on. <laughs> and then you hear God. I was sitting up three, four in the morning. Some years ago, I've told the story here before, but I heard somebody breaking into my workshop. And, why oh, that's my livelihood. And I had nothing but my shreddies on, I put a dressing gown on, some boots and legs outside, and I put my sort of, and there's, I could see a little torch going around inside my workshop. And I put my best sort of fee fi fo fun voice on. You know, it, you know how cats, when they're frightened, they make themselves really fluffy? Well, I was sort of trying to do that, and luckily my dressing gown was really fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> Imposing. But I put on my big fee fi fo voice, 
and I heard God. Still, small voice. Which was, these are the moments that define our lives. Didn't say anything else. These moments of crises, these moments of something happening, these moments when otherwise you'd be reft and why didn't God answer me? God spoke to me, these are the moments that define your life. And suddenly that bloke came running out of his shed. And I got him. And I said to him, do you not know how many people love you? And he broke. He just crumbled in my hands. I said, do you not know how much God loves you? And then I thought, this man, I don't know what to do. I took him in. I took him into the house. We had coffee. We talked and talked and talked. He's a heroin addict. Yeah. I gave him, you know. And it broke. But I was in that place, and I'm not. Because I got in the habit of getting up. And it's not hard to spend time with your lover. It's not hard. It's not, it's not an onerous task to spend time with the one who loves you. To be in love. It's spring. Mm. We're to be in love. We're made. These humans, we are are made to be in love. Mm. When you're in love with somebody and you walk with them, they know this. Your feet are in synchronicity. Your heartbeats become in synchronicity. You finish each other's sentences. You know the will of God because he who lives in love lives in God and God in them for God is love. And so, do we want to hear God? Yes. How do we hear God in that fashion, which is the bedrock of all our other prayers, is time. Spend time with the one who loves you, who you love. Fall back madly, yeah. deeply in love, in a fevered, dizzy love. Again. And if you're not there, make that your priority. I do that in the morning, then when I wake up I have my prayer walk and I go through the list of all the people that are important. But then, and it's Nick who's got the brilliant, he just, you're just talking with God. You just spend time and you're talking with God. And it sounds, ooh, law, up to the cloud. But I'm just think, thinking with God, that's what you say, isn't it? Not talking, thinking with God. I'm walking around and I'm thinking <coughs> with God. And I'm not, thoughts are rising up and I'm playing with them and I'm dropping them down and other thoughts rise up and I play with them and I drop them down and I don't think they're being generated by my brain. Because so many times that afternoon somebody says the very thing that I was thinking about. And it happens again and again and again so I was just thinking about that. And again in the evening everyone else has gone to bed. I just spend an hour sitting in love. And it goes through seasons. Sometimes it, it, you have to be a little bit more diligent. Sometimes, I'm like, dear God, I hope that I'm not blaspheming. It, 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 sometimes you're sitting there and, and you know when a cat, big old fat cat, won't let you do the laptop. It's insistent and it's in and you're trying and it's purring and, it, and you give up and you have to do it. I feel sometimes God's your presence like that. <laughs> and I have to just stop and do so. So... The prayer is that if you're not there, make that a priority. Fall back in love. It's spring, it's the season of love. Fall deeply, deeply, helplessly in love. Forever. Forever. And the people who were, the world changed around them. And you're like that. The man I, I committed, you, I, poor old fellow, I cut him off. He was angry, jumping out of his car. And I get there and I'm looking at his bald old head and his liver spots and he's giving me a hard time. And my heart just says, I love you. And I haven't engineered that, I haven't thought about it spontaneously. I haven't said it. <laughs> but then suddenly he sort of comes down and, and you know, and it spontaneously is the call of God.
So there's some things I like to say it's sort of practical to do. So I think practically, if you are, and it might not apply to you, and it's hard if you've got small children and things like that, you've got huge amounts of responsibilities. But if you do wake up in the night, consider getting up. And consider not watching that film. Consider just spending a few minutes until you feel God's presence and fullness and get habituated to it. Then, throughout the day, you'll find you're just dipping in and out. So when you do have the situation, God, your access to God is present. Instantly. Thank you, God. And the other thing is, is when, and this is practical, and I just think we do need some, because it, to talk about hearing God and not to mention prophecy is, is also probably slightly amiss. And sometimes God does use, you know, sometimes it's strikingly saying there was a party on College Green, sitting there, and Sarah Dickens and somebody wanted me to go up and we would all talk. And they're all sitting there, and just suddenly I know, and I say to this man, you haven't lost your job, but your contract's come to an end. And the whole group go bonkers, freaking, shrieking, freaking out, because that was his goodbye party, because that's what had happened. And that's just God coming out. And that's just, but it isn't thinking. So those of us who speak in tongues, you'll be aware that when you speak in tongues, you're not using your flesh and blood brain. You're not using it. You stop using it. You don't think, I'm now going to say, Karala Shama Baba, whatever. It comes spontaneously. It's that same way of disengaging your brain that you start feeling prophecy rising up. And it's not angsting, or am I right, am I thinking like, like that? It's a lot of trust involved. And there's also discernment required. But you start rising up from that place. Mm. Mm. I love you all. Mm. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> it's the time. There's hell coming here. And that's the only thing that's going to get us through. And there's hell coming in your own personal lives. And it's the only thing that's going to get you through. And the casualties that we know, I think they wandered from their first love. And that will keep, that's a strong power. And the righteous run into it and they are saved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm.